In the simplest description of a disciple from the gospel accounts, Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. The consequences of such training, again, a disciple not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those who are of his household? And a further radical cost, demand that Jesus requires. If anyone comes after me and doesn't hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And two proofs of authentic discipleship. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Let's pray. Lord, bring life into this room and into my and our hearts together as we consider a disciple of yours from the 19th century. Lord, we don't want so much a spotlight on him, and he certainly never would have wanted that, but certainly on his Savior and certainly on the tremendous advantage it is to accede to his wishes, to recognize that when he imposes his way, it is for his glory and our everlasting good. So bring, we pray, bring to life what we need for life afresh in our own lives and callings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, take a look at the man himself in his mature years. This is David Livingston. He uh, was born in uh, 1813 and died uh, 60 years later. He died so remotely in Africa that it took his followers 15 months to carry his remains back to the coast and then on to England to be buried at Westminster Abbey. He was a contemporary in history uh, in this country of Abraham Lincoln and in his own country of uh, the Great Britain of Charles Darwin. When he was 10 years old, uh, he began to work in a cotton mill uh, in the town where he was born and in that same year, Victoria became Queen of England for the next 64 years. In 1871, the great news here in America was the great Chicago fire. That was the year that Livingston, who had been lost in Africa, was discovered by Henry Morton Stanley. Now let's talk about this little man. He never grew up to be more than five foot tall, five foot eight inches tall. Blantyre, Scotland is uh, near Glasgow, near the big industrial city on the west side of, of uh, the country of Scotland. He was born into a family of uh, devout parents. Uh, he, he was born and lived in a tenement factory house with 24 other families in a 14 by 10 foot room. They shared that room together with, with his four brothers and sisters. There was no running water, and um, it, was a, it was a challenge that would prepare him for the challenges of uh, the life that, that was ahead of him. As I said, when he was 10 years old, he began to work in a uh, cotton thread making company. He started at 5.30 in the morning, and he worked until 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Like a few other of the ambitious uh, children, he went from there to school from 8 o'clock until 10 o'clock at night. And then he went home to dinner and to study, often until midnight. And uh, his mother says that there were times when he had, she, she had to come into the room and take his books away from him. So he, and he did this for six days a week 
for 10 years of his life. A 10-year-old, and by the way, today is the 10th birthday of my grandson Emmett out in Colorado, and I had the opportunity to look at him and tell him that I was going to talk about somebody his age in a very different circumstance than him, a fourth grader. One of the remarkable things about David was that by the time he was 10 years old, he was already a voracious reader. And uh, one of the, a portion of the first paycheck that he received went to buying a Latin grammar, rudiments of Latin, uh, a, a language that he studied for many years hence. And it helped him, of course, when he went into the profession of becoming a medical doctor. And while he worked, he would take whatever book he was studying and he would set it on the spinning jenny. And uh, as he walked, and by the way, these, these uh, piecers or uh, spinners, they, they often had to walk 20 miles a day walking around the, 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 uh, the mill and uh, working in stiflingly hot uh, temperatures, 80 to 90 degrees. That was considered the, the best temperature uh, for making thread. And these, these machines were just roaring. And so he'd put a book uh, on the jenny perch there and uh, he would read a sentence and then he'd walk around and then come back and read the next sentence. And he said, I could keep up a fairly continuous stream of education. The other, the other piecers didn't appreciate that. They would often throw bobbins at his books trying to knock them off the perch. And of course, his supervisor thought it slowed him down in his works. And if that machine ever broke down, he, he'd be beaten for, uh, for his inattention. So he, he lived a rigorous life for years and years. And perhaps because no one appreciated what he was doing, he had no friends uh, in, the, um, in the factory. That's why he was there for 10 long years. Now, after he graduated, as it were, he finally uh, graduated to, to, to op operating the machines themselves. And this gave him more opportunity to uh, save money so that he could go to school. He'd been saved as a teenager and compared it to, as in later life, he said, becoming a Christian was, was like being cured of, of uh, color blindness. All of a sudden, the, the glow of Christ came through to me See if I can find the actual description of the way he, uh, he described himself. The perfect freeness with which the pardon of all our guilt is offered in God's book drew forth feelings of affectionate love to him who bought me with his own blood. In the glow of that love that Christianity inspires, I resolved to devote my life to the alleviation of human misery. So he went from being a, a worker in the factory to Christ and then from Christ to this desire to alleviate human misery. And, and so he, he became a medical doctor. At least he began studying to become a medical doctor, which in those days was the best the world had to provide, but it was still quite primitive. Nevertheless, Livingston was devoted to that study of medicine his whole life, even when he got to Africa. There, wasn't, there, weren't, there was no such thing as chloroform. There was no cures for uh, malaria. But one of the things that he did was pay attention to the witch doctors and to the herbs and the other uh, potions that the witch doctors said would be of use. And he experimented on them him, himself. And he stayed alive for, for uh, 30 years of his life, which was a remarkable thing, as you might know about that era of missions history. A lot of, of the missionaries who went packed their belongings in a coffin, knowing that they were never going to return. Livingston returned three times. The year 1832 was for him the year he was promoted to be a spinner, a, an operator of the... Uh, of the machines. In that same year, the British Parliament made history as well. It was the first, uh, in the first uh, place, they passed the reform bill stipulating social and educational reforms to better the conditions of people like himself. 
But secondly, it was in the following year, 1833, that uh, Parliament passed the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. Missionary societies now consider the freeing of slaves to be the first step towards spiritual freedom. And there was an optimism that stirred right into the young, to the young spinner as he started off to uh, university studies. The year 1839 would affect Livingston's career as much as world affairs. He had initially, as he came near to his graduation from medical school as well as his appointment with the London Missionary Society, hoped that he could go to China. Uh, however, China was involved in, with, uh, with England in an inglorious opium war. Now, if you've heard of the opium war between China and, uh, and England, you would assume it was the Chinese who wanted the opium trade and the British were trying to stop it. It's exactly the opposite way around. It was fought from 1839 to 19, or 1842 between the ruling dynasty and the British East India Company. The issue was Chinese refusal to allow the British to continue importing opium from their colony in India. China was humiliated militarily and her interior was pried open for the sake of trade and missionary activity. <laughs> Resentment against Westerners was the long-term result. A matter of months before Livingston left, instead of going then to uh, China, his, his attention was redirected to Africa. On a chance meeting while as a, 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 a student uh, in a missionary uh, living quarters, he happened to meet a man named Robert Moffat. Moffat was something of a hero already because he had established a mission in the interior of, uh, of Africa and he sought to persuade the young man to come there. He sought it by telling him about the, quote, vast plains north of my mission where, quote, sometimes can be seen by the light of the morning sun the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary has ever been. And so off he went. Took him three months to get there. That's how long the sailing ships uh, took to get from London to uh, the Cape. Cape Town, South Africa. He was 27 years old when he uh, arrived there. Now remember, here's a young man who had no childhood, no real adolescence. He had little or no play or recreation. To achieve what he had acquired, qualities were needed that left little room for anything but serious considerations. Though his heart was tempered by this love for Christ and this desire to serve humanity, his own endurance and overcoming spirit inclined him to judge others by the same standards that he applied to himself. And he had little patience with those whose views differed from his own. Therefore, when he arrived in Cape Town, first of all, he saw that the huge slave trade was the one deeply entrenched economy of the continent. The inland Africans themselves were willing to capture, transport to the coast, and sell their neighbors. So there was no need for anyone to, for the slavers to risk going into the interior. Nevertheless, Livingston was bluntly stated in his determination to emancipate coastal slaves and to eradicate the practice among the inland tribes. So he made his way after a month, just a month in the Cape Colony, after alienating virtually everybody there, and uh, therefore to no one's uh, uh, sadness, making his way 900 miles, first up the coast and then inland to meet up with Robert Moffat. Now here's a young man who always loved the outdoors but didn't get much opportunity in growing up to enjoy it. Africa 
Africa was glorious to him. He said it was like going from one day to the next. It was like going from one picnic to another. It was just the, the sky was blue. The, 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 the landscape was filled with uh, animals and plants. And, and he had this, this great desire, this scientific desire to make observations and to make journals. I tell you, if you want to be remembered in history, one of the things you need to do is write down your thoughts. He had mountains of journals over, over the course of his life. And of course, he got better and better at it. In fact, he wrote two books, and I'll point those out, out to you later, that are still, still in print. Anyway, as he makes his way up, up uh, into, the, into the coast, he falls in love both with the African landscape and with the people himself. If he could be short and... Uh, uh, inconsiderate of, of European, or European people, it was exactly the opposite with uh, the Africans. He cared for them. He recognized they were lost souls. They'd never heard, they, they would never have heard about Jesus Christ, and his heart went out to them. One of the things we'll say about him is, what is Livingston's place in the mind of the African people, by and large, even today? When he got to uh, Kuruman, um, he began to make exploratory visits. He recognized, in fact, he was disappointed when he got to, to, uh, to uh, Kuruman because he saw that uh, there were only 350 Africans there. And, of course, Moffat had been there for a long time. And they were settled in. And he thought these missionaries had become too comfortable and too luxury-seeking. And so he began making these exploratory trips. He made three of them up to and across the Kalahari Desert, which people said, well, nobody can cross that. Well, he and one of his companions uh, made, made those explorations as well. I have no, mo no ordinary pleasure in telling, he would say, um, murderous about the precious blood that cleanses from all sin. I bless God that he has conferred on me one so worthless, the distinguishing privilege and honor of being the first messenger of mercy to ever trod these regions. Well, the Moffats uh, had been away for a time, and uh, before they returned, these, this first, uh, or, or these exploratory uh, ventures uh, prompted him. He just wanted to get out and further north, and so he, he went up and started a mission station uh, with one other more experienced missionary before the Moffats came came back. When they did, he came back down to Kuruman, and uh, for the first time he met and was immediately smitten by a single neatly dressed woman who was Moffat's daughter, Mary. She had been away completing her education in London, and David remained at Kuruman over that Christmas and developed a friendship with Mary. Then he went back to that mission station that I spoke about called Mobatsa, and uh, among the things that he did that was a life changer for him was uh, to help when uh, 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 the case of, of marauding lions came into the community. And uh, so he, he was asked to come and help. And so he took his gun and uh, went out. And uh, there were several, several lions around. And when he, when he uh, emptied his gun into one of the larger males, uh, and, and, and told everybody, wait a minute, wait a minute until I can reload. As he was reloading, the lion charged him and clamped onto his left shoulder, and he said, he shook me like a terrier shakes a rat. <laughs> he crushed his shoulder, and, uh, and, and two other uh, uh, of his uh, uh, supporters came and, and uh, tried to spear the lion, and Dis, uh, distracted the lion, it ran off and tried to kill them and then dropped dead of the initial shots that uh, Livingston had fired. Well, it took him a long time to recover. In fact, when his shoulder was finally set, he was building uh, a, a house and he lifted something and rebroke the shoulder and then it was, it was uh, awkwardly set. So the, the clavicle here was, was, was set in an incorrect kind of way. When his body was taken back to England, one of the ways to identify it was that irregularly shaped left shoulder. But because, because he was so badly wounded, he was taken back to Kuruman to uh, recover. 
And there Mary began to give him not only attention, but affection. And uh, long story short, the two of them were married within uh, a few months, January 2nd, 1845. Mackenzie, one of the, their uh, biographers said, they shared ideals and partook the cup of their calling in Christ with equal commitment. Mary, in her marriage to David, was to prove herself to be a sensible uh, spouse as worthy as her husband of the reward to be received on the day of judgment. Their marriage was not to be one of idyllic domestic felicity, <laughs> to say the least, but affected by the stern demands of a voc vocation unique in the annals of modern Christendom. They didn't get along, these two missionaries that established uh, Mobazzo, and in fact, as I said, this was the kind of guy that he was, very intolerant of, of uh, someone who uh, he disagreed with. And so, uh, having taken Mary to Mobazzo, they moved to another place called Chuani, 40 miles north. And he, uh, he, he won uh, the chief of that, uh, of that village and, and that location to, to Christ. But a continuing drought, as well as then the lapsing of this chief temporarily back into polygamy, led him to move once again, move fur further north uh, to uh, his, his last mission station effort. So in the course of five years, he built three mission stations. Likewise, uh, in the course of the first seven years of their marriage together, uh, Mary gave birth to four children. Mary and the children would often stay at home while David trekked, and sometimes they traveled with him. The death of their fourth child, Elizabeth Prynne or, uh, Livingston, two weeks after her birth in 1850, as well as a mysterious paralyzing um, uh, disease that uh, captured Mary's face for at least a while, prompted a stinging letter from the more sedentary mother-in-law, Mrs. Moffat. So as they talked things over and went back to Kuruman, uh, it just seemed like uh, uh, he should settle down. But always there was this drive in him to, to, to get into the, into the interior, to, to blaze a pathway or to perish. Here's what he said. Fever may cut us all off. I feel much when I think of the children dying. But who will go if we don't? No one. I would venture everything for Christ. Pity I have so little to give. But he will accept us, for he is a good master. Never one like him. He can sympathize. May he forgive and purify and bless us. We have an intense, immense re region before us. Thousands live and die without God and without hope. Though the command went forth uh, of old, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It is a venture to take wife and children into a country where fever, African fever, prevails. But, but who that believes in Jesus would refuse to make a venture of such a captain? A heart's parent alone can feel as I do when I look at my little ones and ask, shall I return with this or that one alive? However, we're his and wish to have no interests apart from those of his kingdom and glory. May he bless us and make us blessings even unto death. Finally, in 1852, he couldn't stand the criticism of his in-laws or the, or the pressure that he was putting on Mary and the children, so he, he sent them back to England. He was 45 years old now and alone, and he was about to in, uh, enter onto the first of three expeditions in Africa. This would be his most successful one. We could call it the coast-to-coast -coast trip that he made. He started by going almost straight up into the middle of, uh, 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 of the interior of Africa and then going all the way to the west coast of Africa and then, and then not realizing what a tremendous burden it was for Mary to be alone with uh, the children in England because he didn't get any, any messages back from her. He, he turned back uh, to where he had started in the center and then went all the way to the east coast. Well, there you can see uh, the map of the places where 
where he explored. So there he is, first step to all the way to the left. This is the expedition that makes him famous. When he gets back to England, news of his having tramped, and, he, and over the course of his life, he traveled 30,000 miles, most of them on foot, and most of them where there were no, were no roads. When he got back to England, he was, he was a national hero. It was a convenient time in British history for him to be a hero because there was a war in Crimea and it was not going well. There were troubles in India as well. So the, the and here was, a, here was a commoner who had overcome a lot of obstacles and barriers and so he was received with, with great acclaim. He wrote to, about his, uh, his uh, experiences and here's where his journaling and uh, just the, the capacity that he had to describe something that was brand new came to, for, uh, came to the fore. This was a national belt bestseller overnight. A mission, the missionary travels in South Africa, including a sketch of 16 years of residence in the interior of Africa by David Livingston. He used the proceeds from this, uh, this book to basically uh, provide for a second expedition. He was going to take Mary back uh, with him, he le leave the children in, in Africa, and one of the, I mean, in, uh, in England. One of the great burdens of his life that, that just haunted him his whole life was that he didn't spend enough time with his wife and his children. The Scottish word for the little ones is, why didn't I spend more time with my bairns, my little ones? Now they've all grown up and forgotten me. I don't have them anymore. So it haunted him, but nevertheless, this desire to go back and again to find that, that uh, arterial uh, river uh, highway into, the, into uh, Africa where commerce, where um, marketing could happen and the, and the African people be persuaded not to, not to trade with the, on each other but uh, to open up the markets uh, for, for uh, other goods. The second, the second great expedition that he, uh, that he went on, in fact, because the missionary society, the London Mission Society, um, uh, refused to send other missionaries in. That was just too dangerous to, to do that. And so he quit the London Missionary Society and appealed to the government, to the British government, that he might become a, a, a consul of, uh, of the government for the east coast of Africa. And he was given that opportunity, again on the hope that uh, he would open up commerce and that would be good for uh, the, British, um, the British economy. And so he went back uh, now as a representative of the, of the British government. As he came back a hero after the first uh, of his expeditions, he came back a, um, a failure at the second. One of the things that doomed him was because he was assigned to, to, to be a, a leader of other men. And as, I, as I've already commented, he had no training to do that and he had no disposition <laughs> to do it as well. He took along one of his younger brothers and his younger brother, Charles, was a troublemonger from the very beginning, stirring up all kinds of conflict and, uh, and, and difficulty. And all of this besides the fact that Africa itself just overcame the, the desire that they had. He was trying to go up the Zambezi River and uh, discovered that there was no way for that to happen because it was a series of, uh, of uh, waterfalls and, and uh, rapids. There's the greatest of those rapids or, or, or waterfalls. This is actually something he discovered after five years of being on, uh, first hearing about uh, the, the, uh, the water or the, uh, what's the African name for it? The, something you know, that, that thunders, the, the, the water that thunders. He finally saw Victoria Falls uh, on uh, the Zambezi River. So, his dreams of, of using the Zambezi as the way to get into Africa were shattered. But what it did for him on the second expedition was it turned him north, turned him into the very region where he could discover and see firsthand the, the terrible um, plague, the poison as he called it, the poison on the continent of uh, the African and Swahili 
uh, slave trade. He came into those areas and, and he was, ser again, searching for a waterway, trying to dis solve the mystery of the inland water system of Africa. But more than that, he was seeking to preach uh, along the way, al always, uh, always a as a missionary first and an and explorer second. When he came back on this second expedition, so we call, would call this the, uh, the Zambezi ex expedition, um, he took Mary with him and uh, on the way discovered that uh, they were pregnant for the sixth time. And so she went to Kuruman and he uh, headed off on his own trying to, uh, to f fulfill his, his uh, vision. As, it's, as I said, on this expedition he was in charge of a large contingent of men because he demanded of every man the, ma the same stamina and t tenacity he himself had, he became incredibly impatient, except with the natives. Perhaps because of their cultural differences, he had little time for un Europeans unlike himself. Again, it was in December of that year, 1858, that uh, his dream of using the Zambezi was foiled. On February 21st, 1862, Mary and David were reunited after she had given birth to their youngest son, Oswell. Mary had caught uh, malaria a number of times and uh, had always recovered, but on the 21st of April, she took ill and did not respond to treatment. She died on the 27th, and the man who had faced so many deaths and braved so many dangers was now utterly broken and wept like a child. In his diary, he poured out his heart. It's the first heavy blow I have suffered and quite takes away my strength. I wept over her for, for who well deserved many tears. I loved her when I married her, and I, the longer I lived with her, I loved her the more. God pity the poor children who were all tenderly attached to her. Now, his manner of life softened after this for a time, but... Uh, his previous inflexible determination now hardened even more into an obsession to push himself to the limits of his endurance. Well, because the expedition ex was extended and was a failure from the standpoint of finding that waterway, it was, it was called off. And uh, he, was, he, he came back to England now a second time and uh, he failed Again, even though he had uh, explored some additional rivers in the interior of Africa. Now a third opportunity comes to him, however. Again, it's to, this time to find the source of the Nile. So the first time, the first expedition, coast to coast. The second, the Zambezi, which is a failure. Now, here's a riddle. Where is the, is the source of the Nile in uh, the interior of Africa? Once on African soil, he decided... <laughs> for, to his own benefit to travel alone, in large measure because he didn't have a lot of funds to do it, but also because he wouldn't be any threat to suspicious tribespeople, that uh, he was a slaver, or that he carried a lot of goods and therefore might be a good source uh, to raid and so forth. He set on now at the age of 53. He advanced through the horrors of the trades uh, um, and saw, saw it firsthand, and in fact, the most crippling event of his life, besides the loss of his wife and, and uh, uh, alienation from his children, was that he happened to be in a market at a, in a, uh, um, among a cannibalistic people, a marketplace, and uh, uh, Arab slave traders came in with guns and began shooting in the crowd. They shot them not only in the, in the center of this market, but as they tried to flee to the river, others of these Arabs were there to gun them down. Hundreds of, of Africans were killed. As usual, David, with the, with the courage that uh, was unusual, uh, began to, to wave the, a British consulate flag. Come to me, come to me. They won't kill you if, if you come under the, the, the protection of the British flag. And so he was able to save a few and to minister to others. He was horrified and stricken by this, uh, by this massacre, so much so that uh, uh, he, uh, it, it almost uh, gave him a, a, a nervous breakdown. But he wrote it down, and, and uh, when he was discovered by uh, Livingston, or I mean by uh, uh, Stanley, uh, he gave that report 
uh, to Stanley to take back to England. And it was, it was the horror of, of that massacre that Stanley was able to carry back to England that aroused the, the uh, British people and the parliament and sent a, a consul to Zanzibar on the east coast and, and to the sultan there. And finally, it put a, an end to the slave practice uh, in East Africa. This happened, however, a year after, or I, I should say a month after Livingston died. He was uh, again on his, on his third and last journey. Uh, I've just described it. He compiled the account of the, to the British government, a report he would never see the effect of, but it so uh, enraged the British public that it was one of the leading pieces of evidence for ending the slave trade. Well, his life was broken and his health was as well. And he'd been gone so long that uh, people wondered whether he was alive. And uh, the scoop of the century happened when Henry Morton Stanley, an American newspaper man, found him. And uh, after searching for him for two years in the interior of Africa and uh, uttered the, those famously understated greeting, Dr. Livingston, I presume, even though Livingston was the only white man within a thousand square miles and Stanley was the only other white man in that area. Stanley proved uh, himself to be a wonderful godsend uh, and, and Livingston didn't mind. I should have mentioned uh, he wrote a second book after the second expedition called the Zambezi Expedition, something about his, exp his exploration, but mostly about the African slave trade and trying to see it, it ended. He didn't mind that Stanley was going to make money as a newspaper man because he knew the story would get back. And in fact, as a little boy, I can remember seeing this book uh, on my parents' bookshelf, Stanley, How I Found Livingston. He was quite, a, he was quite different from, from uh, Livingston in many ways, and yet at the same time, he, uh, uh, he felt a, a deep uh, attraction to, to Livingston as well. And when he returned to England, he, tend to, he turned the tide of, of opinion in Livingston's favor. And uh, search parties were actually sent out afterwards uh, to try to bring him back. By then he had already passed away and his, um, his uh, supporters, his, his servants made the amazing decision that they would carry his body the 1,500 miles back to the coast. They, they disemboweled him and buried his heart in Africa, but then they mummified him and concealed his, his identity so that superstitious tribes wouldn't stop them uh, from carrying a, a, dead per, a dead person back with them. When they got to England, um, he, he received what's called uh, a full state uh, funeral. In fact, I think we've got a, a picture of, of his gravesite. It's in the very center of Westminster Abbey. And you know, the, these old churches are built in the shape of a cross. And Livingston's grave is right where the the two ed edges of the cross meet. It's very, in the very center of, um, of that great church. The darkest moments of his life worked the greatest mystery, uh, victories. Though he was classified a failed evangelist because he didn't win very many souls for Christ, he uh, encouraged entire missionary societies and many of his porters and servants be, uh, went into Christian work as well. He lacked the uh, grace to suffer fools gladly unless uh, they happened to be weak, ignorant, and, or unsophisticated. Then his patience and benevolence were limitless. He always regretted not spending more time with his wife and his children. Again, the only commoner to be buried in Westminster Abbey in full state honors. The epitaph in that closing line is that is that closing line that he wrote to the New York Herald. All I can say in my solitude is may heaven's rich blessing come down on everyone, American, English, Turk, who will help to heal this open sore of the, of the world. And on the other side, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. They will hear 
my voice. Among the last things that he wrote, well, maybe, maybe I can just end with this. I, I see that our time has expired. As this uh, poem, it was one of many in, uh, recorded in the funeral procession and burial. Droop half-mast colors, bow bareheaded crowds as this plain coffin o'er the side is slung to pass by woods of masts and ratline shrouds as erst of Africa's trunk Leanna hung. Tis the last mile of many thousands trod with failing strength but never failing will by the worn frame now at its rest with God that never rested from its fight with ill. Or if the ache of travel and of toil would sometimes ring a short, sharp cry of pain from agony of fever, blame, and boil, t'was but to crush it down and on again. He knew not the trumpet he had blown out of the darkness of that dismal land, had reached and roused an army of its own to strike the chains from the slave's fettered hand. Now we believe he knows, sees all is well. Now God has stayed his will and shaped his way to bring the light to those with darkling in darkling dwell with gains that life's devotion well repay. Open the abbey doors and bear him in to sleep with king and statesman, chief and sage. The missionary come of weaver's kin, but great by work that brooks no lower wage. He needs no epitaph to guard a name which men shall prize while worthy work is known. He lived and died for good, that be his fame. Let marble crumble, this is living stone. Let's pray. Father, uh, too little time to talk about so many things in his life. As a scientist, as a, as a doctor, as a lover, as a explorer, and most of all, as a humble servant of yours. Thank you that uh, he used his life up to the last breath. Thank you, Lord, for the memory of it. Lord, uh, would you grant that we would run all the way to the finish line, even as he had to be carried across it by those he loved. Thank you now for this chapel experience. Thank you for this topic of discipleship. Oh, God, please um, do it again. Do it in this age. Do it among us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.